or two as people are joining. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we'll get started in just about a minute. We're still letting some people into uh, the Zoom room. I'm really excited to uh, facilitate the conversation. And again, we'll get started in just about 45 seconds. Well, good afternoon in most places of the country. Good morning on the far west coast. We hope you are all having a, an awesome day. My name is Dave Schuler, and I am the executive director of AASA, the School Superintendents Association. And I have the honor of facilitating and moderating today's conversation, which is the second of a three-part webinar series on generative AI, what it is and what it is not. So the essential questions as part of this webinar series are really thinking about how we can demystify AI and what leaders should be thinking about as we go into the summer, as things are trans, uh, transforming so quickly, what information is needed for policy, protocols, and practices, and how do we prepare our teachers and students for using AI as a tool? And should AI impact summer professional learning? I would say yes, but your answer might be different. Um, and if so, how? And finally, what are some trusted resources that educators can use as things are moving so quickly? So I am thrilled to be able to be part of this, an ASA, part of this three-part series in collaboration with ISTE, ASCD, Digital Promise, COSIN, and Collegiate EduNation. This collaborative is meant to demystify and build understanding of the possible uses of AI for educators. It is a great honor this afternoon to welcome a former Assistant Secretary for the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Educational Technology, who currently serves as Executive Director of ISTE and ASCD, Richard Collada. Richard is an amazing thought leader in this space. And Richard, I wonder if we could start by you sharing a little bit about what is ISTE doing to build understanding of generative AI? I'm certainly happy to, and, and great to great to be here. What a, what a fun group of people to get to hang out with for a bit here. So glad to... Uh, Glad, glad to be on. Um, would it be appropriate if I just, you know, took a few minutes and shared some some uh, some slides of, of a couple of things that we have going on? Is that? Uh, what, I think that would be wonderful, Richard. Great. Right. Yeah. Let's do it. So, so here's what I'll do. I, I'll share a couple things. I'll share a couple quick slides. I'll share a couple of resources that we have, and then I'll pause to see if there is uh, any any uh, questions. And I'm assuming that the chat is working. Is that right? If people want to, and I know some people are watching this by YouTube. And so if that's the case, just think really hard and I'll try to like, you know, uh, perceive your your questions. But for those of you that are are uh, participating via Zoom, please drop drop your questions in there. So um, here's where here's where I'll start. I think uh, uh, the the key, uh, you know, it, one of the issues that we have here is we're, we're lar largely going about thinking about AI, uh, maybe in the wrong way. I, I don't mean to start with a you know a, a negative tone, but I do feel like um, we're we're sort of missing the, the the boat a little bit. And and here's what I mean: we work with we're working with districts across the country on this issue, uh, and almost always the first question that we get is a question about uh, how do we stop cheating. Right, it's just generally where it starts, and so I just want to let's just put that out of the way for a second. And I and I know, I know that's an important question, and I know we need to talk about it. But if your worry is about cheating, the problem isn't AI. The problem is the quality of your assessments. I don't know how else to say it. It just and and it's and and it, and and we have for a long time put up with you know, pretty crappy assessments. Uh, and, and we've put up with them in part because I, I guess we've been able to. And so so AI and chat GPT really isn't causing a problem with your assessments. It's just shining a spotlight on assessments that aren't very good. And so, so if we want to fix those, we can talk about that. That's probably another conversation. There's lots of great resources that AASA has. ISTE and ASCD has a ton of, uh, you know, of resources that we can help you to think about how to do more authentic assessments. But if you, again, if your concern is, hey, how do we stop cheating? Probably the most important thing that you can do is is pause for a minute and talk about are there are there some better assessment approaches? What I want to shift to uh, a little bit are, are what I think are some some you know better questions. I think there are some more important questions that we need to be asking. And uh, I'm gonna um, uh, I'm, I'm actually gonna share 
uh, five skills that I'm going to be sharing in a couple weeks. In, in two weeks, uh, we have an event uh, called ISTE Live. It's our big event where we bring everybody together in the summer. And I'm going to be sharing uh, five skills that I think we need to be thinking about uh, bringing into schools in this AI-infused world. So I'm going to do a little, this a little preview of coming attractions here. So uh, so if you're coming to ISTE Live, just sound surprised if you hear me say them. But um, let, me, let me try to share my screen. Uh, and I'm going to do it um, in a slightly different way. Let's see if that works. Oh, almost. There we go. So uh, hopefully you can uh, you can see that. And uh, I'm going to, um, that's just my splash screen, just in case you hadn't heard, just DNA, CD are coming together. Uh, it's going to be cool. But uh, but what I really wanted to do is jump into the, share these sort of these five skills that I think we need to be thinking about. Um, and, and then I'll point you to some resources that might help. The first is uh, we need to be understanding what AI is. So, so I'm talking about the role of school leaders. So superintendents and to some extent principals, this is really what we need to be, be these are the skills that we need to be talking about. I, I worry that we are, you know, we're not, we're not uh, talking enough about what it really is. And uh, it, it starts to feel like AI is magic. So our, our kind of our mantra for this work is AI is not magic. Magic is something mysterious that you can't control. Uh, AI is neither one of those things. Uh, but it's critical that we talk about what it really is. And when we understand what it really is and how it works and how it's based, uh, it makes it much easier to then figure out how it can be helpful and how it can't be. By the way, really quickly, there's a bunch of different types of AI. I hope you all know this. Uh, uh, but but the but the generative AI, which is what we're largely talking about here today, are uh, essentially, a, a, you know, it's a, um, I'm giving you the, the 30 second crash course on what AI actually is, right? So, so, so uh, AI... It, you know, it, it, there's a, there's a model, a language model. It's usually a large, you know, large database of content. It could be a bunch of documents, could be a bunch of websites, could be a bunch of stuff on the web. And then there's a, a model where a computer is trained to make meaning out of that. And then apps can be built on top of, uh, of those models. So chat GPT is one app. Uh, it's why I laugh when schools often say, well, we're going to block AI. No, you're not. You can't, you can't, it's like saying we're going to, we're going to block electricity. Like you can't, it's not, it, it's not a thing to be blocked. Uh, there may be apps that you're blocking. You may choose to block specific apps and that's fine. But, but if you're saying we're blocking AI, like that's not possible. It's, 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 a uh, it's, it's infused throughout, you know, most of the web at this point. And so, so just being really clear about what AI is, I think is really helpful for making more meaningful uh, conversations. The second skill, and, and I'm going to move through this fast, but 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 I, I hope you'll get the idea of it. The second skill is we need to be helping young people understand uh, what it means to generate solutions with AI. Um, I spent a long time working for a company called IDEO. IDEO is a company that does a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, companies will come and say, hey, build us a great new product or a great new idea. And, and they pay IDEO a lot of money because they're very creative. And, and IDEO has some, some special processes. But the main reason that IDEO is so uh, impactful is that where we think about two or three possible solutions and then pick one, the IDEO teams come up with 100, 200 solutions and then pick one. Uh, and, and, and my point being that most innovation is not just because somebody is inherently brilliant. It's, it comes from people who are able to push to, to brainstorm 20, 30, 40 possible solutions and then come up with uh, an idea. That's the most powerful thing that AI can do because coming up with 20, 30, 40 solutions is very time consuming. Most of us don't have that much time in our lives to do. But when we can learn to outsource solution generation to AI, it can be very powerful. So we can say, look, we'll come up with a couple, two, three solutions. We're going to let AI come up with eight, nine, 10, 20 solutions. And then we're going to pick what's the right one. That's a really powerful skill that young people today are going to need to have in order to uh, uh, go into learning in life in the future. And that brings me to the third skill, which is uh, we need to be preparing, you know, all, look, every kid that's going to graduate from your schools, uh, they're going to go work on teams where not all members of their team are human. And we need to be preparing them for what that means. What does it mean when a peer member of your team is AI? What does it mean when a subordinate is AI? What does it mean when you are working for AI? And, and truly, I can tell you today, cases of all of those things that are happening in the workforce. And so I think it's really critical that we talk about what those skills are and, and, and what does that mean. Um, two more. Uh, skill number four, we need to be talking about uh, teaching concepts over... Um, sorry, I told you this is draft. I'm working on this as we speak. Um, We'll just edit my my presentation as we go. I should have said that AI made these slides and blamed it on AI. I missed the chance to do that. Uh, anyway, 
So skill four is teaching concepts and curation over content creation. So school today, if you look at the design of school today, it is almost entirely based around content creation. I have to write a paper. I have to come up with an answer to a math problem. I have to come up with a, a you know a book report, a project. But it's interesting to think about moving forward, uh, how important in the world is, is it going to be that we can create our own content? I don't know. I have a hunch that it will be far more important to understand the basic concepts in order to curate what content that is created by AI or somebody else is more valuable for us in our circumstances. That's a big shift. And so when you think about, you know, uh, do we need, does, does, does value come from me creating everything myself? We get really bent around the axle in schools about saying, uh, was that your work? Is any work really our work? Honestly, all the work, my, my wife is a, is a musician and she, uh, is, is, you know, talks about composers and, and we come up with our, you know, new, newly composed music. Any music that's been composed in, 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 at least in the Western world is basically some regurgitation of Bach and Beethoven, right? Yes, you're mixing it up. Yes, you're matching it up. But I think we, we, we have a, a um, uh, maybe an oversampled sense of what is unique work when really most of what we're generating is just a mix up or a mashup of information that we've taken in from others. I think that's okay. It's just a different skill set, right? It's a skill set of knowing when to recognize value in content uh, over necessarily creating it from scratch. And the last one, the last skill, and I know I'm moving very quickly here, but the last skill is we need to learn to be better at being human. We have had, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of years of having a monopoly on uh, uh, on decision making, on higher level thinking, uh, on on creativity. And all of a sudden, we're in a world where uh, where we aren't the only ones who can who can have those skills. But the problem is when you when you have a monopoly on on skills like that, you don't spend time recognizing what uniquely human skills are. Um, I wrote a book uh, about a year ago called uh, Digital for Good, and it talks about how we can create help young people uh, grow up in a, in a in a digital world. And one of the questions that I asked is, what's the value of being human in a digital world? And and I didn't mean it sarcastically. I mean it very literally. What value do humans bring? Uh, I think most of us, including most of our teachers, can't answer that question. And I think we need to be able to answer it. I think there are some very unique skills. I think curating is one of them. I think empathy and love and uh, uh, um, you know creativity. These are some critical human skills that are never going to be able to be outsourced. But if we can recognize that those are the unique skills and double down on them, then we, we're actually using uh, you know, our, our, our time uh, to, to be uh, emphasizing and building the muscles for those skills that really are the ones that that uh, that aren't going to be replaced, and right now I think we're we're, we're sort of uh, sort of confused about that. So so those are just five skills that I think there are five questions that I would encourage you uh, to be to be asking with your with your teams when it comes to thinking about um, uh, AI. Uh, let me let me quickly share one other thing here, and that is some just some resources and places that you can go uh, if you'd like to learn more. And we'll talk more about. I know we'll do a discussion at the end, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, but I'm going to share a different screen there. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, and my um, browser, I speak Spanish, so my browser is all set to Spanish. So let me change that back to English. There we go. So there's a there's a page Richard, here. You can't see it. Still see, still, we still see it. There, there you go. Thank you. I, I, I am also learning how to use Zoom. Apparently it's only been, you know, five years since we've <laughs> learned how to use Zoom and I still can't do the screen share, right? Um, all good. So, uh, so, so look, if you go to isti.org slash AI, it's faster to do that. It's just easier to say AI and I'll throw it in the chat. Isti.org slash AI, you'll get to this page. It's where we have all of our stuff. Um, we have great, these great guides. These are guides that we created for uh, elementary, secondary. They're one for science uh, and one for, for elective educators in secondary. They're English, Spanish, and, and Arabic. If there's anybody on the call that needs that. Uh, and and they're they're just a great series of activities that can be done to help teach AI concepts in the classroom. So please take advantage of those. Don't create them from scratch. They're totally free. You can use them. We also have uh, a bunch of a bunch of resources down below and uh, a really amazing course. Uh, called Artificial Intelligence Explorations. We've taken thousands of educators through this. We're actually um, working closely with New York City Public Schools. Part of why we, there was some change uh, change there uh, was in part because we just took a big cohort of, of educators through this. So please take a look at that if it's helpful. And then the last tip that I'll say before I uh, stop and hand, hand the microphone over here is uh, right now, I think a lot of schools are rushing to come up with their... Um, 
you know, policies on on what exactly should and shouldn't be allowed for for AI, and, and that's fine. But I would I would I would encourage you to pause for a minute and make sure you're taking time to explore what. Uh, what AI really is. So I've talked to school leaders, you guys, I, you're going to, you hopefully will laugh and roll your eyes. And if you do, that's okay. I've talked to school leaders that have asked me to review their policy for AI. And I've said, have you explored, I can tell from reading it that they've never played around with AI before. I said, have you played with it yourself? And they say, no. And so I hand it back to them and I say, excuse me. And I say, I will, um, I will read it after you have spent five hours exploring different types of AI. And, and, and so, and that's the thing you need to do. So my team, we've got 200 people on my team. We took a whole day a number of months ago. We took Friday, canceled all of our meetings. And we said, this is an exploration day for AI tools. And you can't just explore chat GPT. It's great that you've, you've played around with chat GPT. Hallelujah. Glad you've looked at it. Chat GPT is one of thousands of thousands of, of tools that you should be looking at. Uh, there are tools like AI lesson, which generates full uh, lessons. There are co full course generators. There are great uh, tools that generate uh, images. If you haven't played around with um, tools like Mid Journey or, uh, or, or Dolly 2 or, or things like that, it is just critical that you're taking time to explore uh, what these what these uh, what these options are before trying to come up with 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 your policies. And so I would say um, probably the the uh, it is far more important right now to be asking good questions with your teams than to be coming up with with good answers. And the more you can be doing that, the more you can you can as school leaders be focusing on uh, what the um, what those those uh, questions should be. Uh, the better, the better off you will be. Encourage those. The best schools that we've seen are ones that have gone in and said, "We're going to take a faculty meeting. We're going to take you know an hour, and you're going to explore four different ways to use AI." Great. Uh, then at the next meeting or next time we're going to come back, and you're going to share what worked, what didn't. Try to push the limits of it and see see where there's where there's where there's benefit. And then having school leaders that actually highlight, find those best practices that school that that their teachers or or, or principals are using, and share those out. Right, our role has got to be helping to understand this technology and not try to uh, 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 you know make quick rash decisions about it. Um, let me let me end with a final thought there, and I know we still have a little more time, but I'll open it up. If you have questions for those of you that are on. Um, on Zoom and want to throw some questions, uh, uh, please um, please feel free to, uh, to to do that. And otherwise, we'll have more of a Q and A at the end. But my my last thought is, um, we are. Um, let me see. How I want to say this: um, educators, education leaders can't afford to sit this one out. Um, we have. Uh, I have a number of, le of school leaders that I've heard say things like, well, it's evolving too quickly. We're just going to sit this one out and wait, and we'll see, see what happens. That is the worst possible thing that you could do. Uh, this is a technology that we are still shaping. We are very actively shaping it. We're working very closely with OpenAI, which is the company that makes ChatGPT. We're working closely with Google, with Microsoft, and we're giving them feedback from the education community on a regular basis about what they can do. And what I have said is the best, you know, when we get to AI, when we get to a version of AI that's a little more stable, that's not changing all the time, right? When we get, when we get a little more built out, I want to have educator fingerprints all over it. I want it to be loaded with educator fingerprints. And if we don't do that, if we don't get involved now and shape the development of this, uh, it will be a, 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 an enormous missed opportunity and something that I think we will all frankly pay the price for. I'm very optimistic about AI. I'm very optimistic what we need to do, but we have to be involved in the process. And right now that means that you need to be talking with your schools, uh, with, your, with, your, with your leaders, with your teachers about what does this mean? How can you use it? And expanding that horizon, expanding that vision beyond ChatGPT uh, into, into a variety of other, uh, other tools. I'll give you one little uh, 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 quick hint, a preview of coming attractions. We're very excited at, at ISTE and ASCD about training our own uh, AI tools in order to be customized for education content. Um, I can't say a whole lot more about that now. I'll say more, you know, the, uh, you stay tuned in two weeks at our, at our event where, you, where you'll hear more about what we're doing. But right now, the tools that we have are generic. They're generic, uh, uh, you know, they're based on learning models that are, that are generic from the web. And I think this gets really exciting when we start to think about AI tools that are trained specifically on education content. 
Okay, I have talked for too long. Let me pause there. I'm very excited to do Q&A with you afterwards, but I hope that, that my takeaway message is right now we need to explore and be moving away from uh, talking about whether or not we need to worry about cheating to a much deeper conversation, which is how are we preparing our young people to thrive and to lead in a world that is AI infused? Yeah, Richard, I think that's great. And I think you know what I spent a lot of time talking about is the, the potential for AI to really accelerate learning if we think about the work a little differently, you know? And so if an individual gets one to 11 wrong, why are we asking them to do 13 to 53? And if a kid gets one to 11 right, why are we asking them to do 13 to 53? But if you had a teacher that could use AI and create lesson plans and instructional practices that align with every student's proximal zone of development, you could really see an incredible opportunity to accelerate learning for every child, right? And, and I think, you know, it's sometimes it's mindset and having the mindset to say, we've, we have to figure out how to play with this, explore, be creative, and at the same time, um, be safe and responsible. But, um, you know, we have to give teachers and principals and superintendents some time to explore, and that has to be okay, you know? So maybe uh, an agenda at a staff meeting isn't every five minutes and going around and having everybody give a report. Maybe we put together an email and we let everybody play. And maybe we need, maybe, uh, explore sounds so much more professional than play, but play with AI and see what they find. Work together, learn together. I think that, I think it'd be really, um, I think it has huge potential if we embrace it versus push it away. And, and look, and just to build on that. So what a great point is, it, you know, in your, in your, if you're in a faculty meeting, it would be really interesting at some point to say, I mean, this, this, what I'm about to say is huge, you know, hugely powerful modeling. If you were to say, Hey, you know, I'm trying to think about, you know, what's a good example of, I don't know, something, uh, you know, good way to, to. Uh, teach history to fifth graders or something. I don't know, whatever, whatever the thing is. And say, hey, will somebody throw that in ChatGPT real quick? Somebody throw that in ChatGPT and see what we get, right? Just doing that, just modeling that has, will have huge uh, impacts on how how your your team, you, your modeling as leaders is really powerful. I know some leaders that when they send out a note, uh, you know, weekly note to their, their teams, they'll just put a fun image that they had, that they generated on Dolly 2 or on Mid Journey or something like that. And they'll just put a little note. This is the image that I generated on, on AI. Just a simple thing. It's fun. It lightens up your emails. But what it's signaling is it's okay to explore. And those are the districts that are going to hit this out of the park that are comfortable exploring. I saw a district um, a couple months ago where during a faculty meeting, um, they put in chat GPT, um, a student without a name, but had a case manager get up and talk about a student with special education needs and strengths, weaknesses, spent about 15 minutes just going through everything and asked ChatGPT to come up with an IEP for that student. Um, and so you think of this teacher shortage, you think of the hundreds of hours that go into a full case study and they asked the team what they thought of that IEP and they said it was better than the one that they had written. And so it goes back to your concept that curation, and I usually say editing, but it almost becomes more important than the creation and how we could use our time so much more wisely. And if we think about how burned out so many of our teachers have been the last couple of years, if we can help them focus on curation versus creation and assessment, you know, I think it, it's, it's, a, it's huge for the profession and for public education. So let's uh, move, uh, pivot and hear from Digital Promise. And Diane Dirsch is the former CTO for Green Bay Public Schools in Central Wisconsin. And she now leads information technology initiatives at Digital Promise. She's close to the classroom with members of the Digital Promise team as they support innovative learning in schools. Diane, can you share some strategies for helping leaders tap existing structures to build awareness and skills in generative AI and how can educators and students use technology, including AI, responsibly in their digital citizenship? And then how can we adjust curricular expectations and policy guidelines to anticipate AI's next steps? Well, thanks so much for having me, first of all. Um, I, I love this topic and I was writing notes, Richard, as you were not speaking um, regarding- I'm getting ready to write notes highlights. from you too, so we're in good well, shape. Well, there we go, there we go. 
Um, you know, and just this general topic really has me thinking, you know, as a parent or as a classroom teacher, if I was fearful of something, um, I would definitely, you know, try to hide it, of course, but my kids or my students could pick up on that fear, right? And then carry that, potentially carry that fear um, forward themselves. And I almost think about AI in the same way, right? If if we see that school districts are afraid of it or a leader is afraid of it, the people that they influence may say, ooh, I need to be afraid of this as well. And so I think that the points are resonating regarding you know, going into this with an open mind, not going right to it's plagiarism, how, how do we stop it? Um, the things that we don't know and understand, we need to uh, experiment with and try and giving that freedom for our educators to do that and our ed tech leaders and our, our leaders in general to do that is so important. So thank you for that. Um, I think it was last week when uh, we were talking about this, David, and it was, um, you know, AI can provide a first draft of something. And for me as an administrator, you know, I would be in groups where we all try to put stuff together, to brainstorm, to think, to create something. And I learned if I came with a draft first and gave them something to react to, I got a lot more response and we got moving faster, right? And so this is something that can be used in that same way. So uh, again, I'm appreciating the talk um, here today. And this is just part two of three. So thank you, AASA, for, for this. But yes, I'm Diane Dirch, and I'm the Senior Director of Information Technology over at Digital Promise. Before that, I was a classroom teacher, a Director of Technology, and then Chief Technology and Information Officer. Officer, uh, for Green Bay Area Public Schools. I am broadcasting from central Wisconsin right now. Um, and yes, my Midwest accent does give it away. Um, I'm also the chair of COSIN, the Consortium for School Networking, that is the uh, premier um, uh, support for, for um, ed tech leaders like CTOs and um, directors of technology. So we are an association. Uh, so that's a bit about me and the lens from which I'm coming here is from a district perspective. And the first thing is the horses are already out of the barn, okay? You cannot push AI back into the barn. We have been dealing with AI and using AI for a long time. Um, I remember when Alexa came out. Remember that when, it, you know, it, because me as a leader of technology, I was asked to, you know, um, give my opinion on this, to revise policy, to do all those things um, because students or teachers could speak into a device and it would answer, right? And so the horses are out of the barn and we have been dealing with AI for a very long time. Uh, and it's just coming, I think, more into light now because of chat GPT and other generative AI, um, AI tools. I want to point out uh, some resources that Digital Promise um, helped create or created. Um, my colleagues, uh, Jean-Claude uh, Brizard, as well as Jeremy Rochelle, will be on part three of this series. And they helped, um, uh, Jeremy especially helped with the uh, Office of Ed Tech's a report on artificial intelligence. As long as I've known Jeremy within Digital Promise, this is something that he has been um, you know, thinking about and working on, and he's a great resource. And then also um, for me, I had created the Technology Sustainability Toolkit. It came out as part of Verizon Innovative Learning Schools, VILS uh, project that Digital Promise helps to um, support as well. And that just kind of helps you think about all the stuff you need to think about in ed tech as you plan forward. And so hopefully those are some resources that can be used. I wanted to share that, you know, there are different ways of manage the topic managing the topic of AI in the things that you do at school. Okay, you could make it an independent thing, totally solo. You know, this is new and, and we got to talk about it and we're pulling it off, um, you know, to the side and it gets its own 
topic. Okay, so it can be a standalone type of thing, or it could be integrated. Um, let's find the existing things that have maybe um, you know some pieces intertwined with it, and let's tie it into that and integrate it in fully. Or let's pull out themes like maybe data privacy within school districts. And let's tie it to something like that because, you know, there are a lot of things having to do with data privacy uh, regarding artificial intelligence and large data pools. And so this is something to think about as you are um, talking to your staff and working with your staff on AI. What's the approach that you're going to take on this? And you know, really, in a school district, you've got a lot of things. You've, you've got your school leadership and your administrators. You've got your different departments that, you know, the information goes down to all the boots on the ground people. And you, of course, have your students as your end users and also um, parents who need to know a lot about things. So that is a whole bunch of things. And it gets a little scary when you think, oh, my gosh, we've got this new topic. And now I got to get to all these people, right? But, you know, something as I was talking uh, to Valerie from AASA, you know, I said, as a leader, when something new comes along, I always think about what existing structures and processes do we have in place already? You know, again, we don't have to start brand new things all the time, but we can use the existing structures that we have um, to help tackle this issue. And Richard, you gave great examples of just, you know, ditching a staff meeting, maybe putting, you know, all the bullet points in an email and then saying, okay, let's mess around with AI. Um, and let's try a whole bunch of different tools. Here are some links to some things, but maybe you want to try, you know, search for some other stuff. We're really interested in that and, as well. And I always liked, think like a kid. <laughs> what would a kid do? <laughs> um, because again, I think, you know, that kind of mindset really helps me think about, you know, what, what are our students going to be doing with this? And it's not going to be cheating all the time. It's not like they're going to say, well, I'm going to use it to do all my homework, but what creative ways are they going to use it for? And I do believe the best ideas will probably come from our students. But you've got existing structures already. The staff meetings that are taking place at the end of the school year. Don't forget this. Don't forget that over the summer. Turn your keys in. You know, in the old days, that's what it was like. Um, but now with um, so many things going on in the summer, you know, addressing or at least putting out teasers at staff meetings saying, okay, you know what, um, you might want to take this summer to learn about AI, or you might want to experiment a bit, or here is the revised policy on AI, and here are things that you need to uh, talk about when your neighbors ask you, when the people at the grocery store ask you what's going on, when parents say, you know, how, how, is, how is this going to help or hurt my student? Or are you blocking this in the district? Or you need to block this. What are you going to say back to them? And so staff meetings are a great way um, right there to, you know, have that conversation. And again, help demystify the topic. Help people know that this is not something they should be afraid of. Because when our staff members are afraid of AI, we don't want them to make our students afraid of AI. Um, departmental meetings. I tell you, uh, in, in Green Bay, the library media specialists were part of uh, the department that, that I ran. And we worked really hard at that time on data privacy uh, and security, um, you know, uh, digital citizenship, staying safe on the internet, all those types of things. But, we cannot say it is just the library media specialist's job. It is everybody's job, right? And so integrating this into all departmental meetings and subject matter experts, getting them to you know, hone in on their, 
on their subject and you know try out AI and see what's out there and how it can help them. Um, and you know what are the pitfalls? What do we need to look out for? That is a perfect time to do that. You know, we have a lot of people who say, who will say, "Well, that's not my topic, so I'm you know the subject I teach, so I'm not going to listen to that." Or that's for elementary, and I'm a high school teacher. But allowing um, all of your your teachers to use their subject area, um, look for information, and to talk about it, I think is so important. Board of Education meetings. This Diane, might become. Can jump, Diane, can yes. I jump in before you mm -hmm. transition to the board meetings? Because I, I was thinking as you were talking um, and following up on what Richard was saying earlier that school leaders become so important, not just to model. I think the modeling, I love that idea, Richard, but also to give permission for teachers to fail forward, right? This The kids are going to feel so much more comfortable with it, with AI in many cases than the adults will. And it's almost like we need to give permission to the teachers to say, you guys, give yourself some grace. You're not going to be perfect at this right away. And that's totally cool play around, explore, and then maybe try one activity and then share it at the next department meeting with how it went. And it can be a total crash and burn, you guys. That's totally okay, right? Because, But if everything we're doing is working, we're not exploring enough, right? We're not, we, like, I was, I always gave, like, every three years during one of our opening convocations, I would say, you have permission to fail forward. If it doesn't work, call it version 1.0, you know? And I, and I, and I just think, as you were talking, like it's how you use that time and you have to give permission for your teachers to not be perfect at it the first time or the second or the third. Any reaction to that? Well, I can say, uh, David, you're exactly right. When I think back to when our teachers started um, going one-to-one -one and how I had to state to them, it's okay to not feel like you know everything. You don't have to know everything about technology. <laughs> You'll be fine. The kids will figure it out. And I heard from teachers who said, you know, when I gave myself permission to not know everything about something, it was a great weight off my shoulders. And you know what? The kids did know and they did teach me. And these were lessons learned and that's exactly the way it should be, right? Yep. So, you know, I, I think you make a really good point. Richard, is there anything from I, your lens? So I, I I agree. You know, it's funny. I like I like being on panels where, where people disagree. I think it's good, but I, you're just spot on. And so I so we'll find another area to disagree, but this isn't it. <laughs> I think it's really, I think one of the things we just have to be careful about is that sometimes you have educators and sometimes you have school leaders that have built their sort of, identity around having the right answer. And I know when I was first a teacher, I was a teacher years ago. And I remember at one point a student asked me a question and I didn't know the answer. I just didn't know. And what I should have said was, I don't know the answer, let's figure it out. And instead what I did is I pretended to know the answer and I gave an answer that was stupid. The kids knew it was stupid. They, they pushed me on it. And then I had to say these weird things like, well, I mean, you know, clearly that's right. But if you understood how, as deeply as I know, there's these other, and I just, it was just a mess y'all. And I think one of the things that we need to be more comfortable as educators saying is, yeah, I don't know. This is new to me too. Let's explore it together. And that is actually a far more important lesson that we can teach than giving them the right answer for something. In fact, to the point that as I learned that lesson moving forward, even at times when I did know the answer and I legitimately knew the answer, I would still sometimes say, hey, let's figure it out together. We have to do this when it comes to tools like AI because it's changing so quickly, we don't know. And if you can have the confidence to model that to your school leaders, if your school leaders can model that to their teachers, the teachers can model that to the students, then I'm really excited about our ability to thrive in this AI world. That's great. Sorry to interrupt, Diane. I just felt like I want to just mention that. So I'll hand it back to you, sorry. No, I, I love this conversation. I always called it lessons learned. This isn't loser, it's lessons learned. Um, because that art of reflection is so important. And for me as a leader, you know, teaching the, the people I work with to be good reflective um, people in practice and then going upstream to maybe, you know, figure out ways to avoid whatever happened 
is good. And I think that, again, in the let's work it out together, let's find out together, that ability to look back and reflect upon that and make lessons learned out of that is key as well. So um, I think these are great conversations and that does tie into the Board of Education who are going to come with a lot of questions. People are stopping them at the grocery store, at church, at the car lot. And they're asking, what are you gonna do about that AI and, and, and policy? And so being able to you know, have them also use those words about, well, we're learning and we're going to, you know, be working and experimenting, playing um, is, is going to be important. You've got review cycles that already take place, curriculum reviews, policy reviews, um, that ensures that you've got a cadence of things. Now, granted, your policy and curriculum uh, around the topic of AI may have just escalated to the top of the list when it was really on year three, but you know you're going to get to it. So leverage those times. You've got websites out there, right? What, you know, what a great way to include a whole bunch of links for parents to know and understand more about AI, right? And the parent home communication. And that's just what I want to end on here because you know, parents and teens are both excited about this. Um, this is a study by um, Common Sense Media and they uh, surveyed people in May of 2023. And they had some really good things here about, you know, uh, there's excitement about it, but look, look at the last bullet point. Both parents and students want schools to put rules in place for AI soon. Just 26% of parents think their child's school has rules in place for how chat GPT, and notice they're even just using chat GPT and, and not uh, other things, um, can be used by students. And both parents and students want to see rules. Setting up those guardrails is important. Um, and so, you know, majorities of parents, 61, and 51 of uh, students think schools should limit the use of AI programs um, until more rules are made. So again, this is that time of exploration um, at this point. And so using and leveraging those structures you already have in place is so key so that you can keep going and not have to add new things on top because again, the horses are out of the barn. And so if we can work together, um, you know, to put these guardrails in place, there's nothing together that we can't wrangle. So that's from the farm here in Wisconsin. Thank you so much. Thanks, Diane. And would you say, um, you know, from your experience in Green Bay and working with COSIN, that um, the policies related to AI should, districts should do their best to keep it at the 30,000 foot level so that the procedures, which are the, what's implemented by the, the administrative teams can be more nimble and can be adjusted quickly versus having to go through a three to six month policy approval process. Oh, yes. Um, you know, you've got policy and that's what's written on paper and on the website and everything else, but then you've got the rules. And so, yes, being general so that you are inclusive of the new technologies that we don't know about yet and all those things should be in the policy pieces. But the rules we know need to be more nimble so they can change and stretch along with how we go down this um you know, this AI road. So that's a really good point to bring forward is that the rules are, um, you know, going to be more nimble. And that's where you can get specific and rules can be changed without all that lead time that policy changes have. Yeah, that's great. So Richard, if we came back together um, at the end of the first quarter of uh, this upcoming school year, the 23-24 school year, where do you think we'll be in terms of integrating AI into instruction across the country? Yeah, I think uh, um, I can give you my glasses half full answer or my glasses half empty answer. Um, I, 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 will, I will tell you, uh, I would love it if we came back and we were in a very different place in terms of talking about uh, really understanding two different parallel conversations. One is how are we using AI for learning? And two, how is 
the education system, our schools, preparing young people to thrive in an AI-infused world. Those are two different conversations, and we need to keep both uh, front and center. And I think at that point, we will have uh, teachers that are uh, have felt like they've gotten permission and now are at least comfortable with understanding what, what AI is. And I would hope to say that we will also have some schools where where they've gotten you know we've like I, like I mentioned we have this AI course that that we take teachers through it's a deep dive course you don't have to have everybody in your building go through a deep dive into all the ins and outs of AI but you need you know at least one person who has right you kind of need one person on each site who really can be an expert that's where I would hope we would be um my worry uh, and, and I'm a pretty optimistic guy but my worry is what we're going to see, as we've seen in a number of other cases in this situation, is, is sort of a split. We'll see school leaders who say, yep, we got to get ahead of this, we got to get involved, and it will look exactly like, like I just described. And then we will still see some that say, I'm going to sit this one out. I'm going to wait, let everybody figure it out, and then we'll jump in. The problem with that is that it's moving so quickly that if you choose to sit this out, if you choose to not become part of the conversation, the catch-up will be so difficult and so great uh, that it will be very hard to do. And so 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 if you are if you have nobody on this call is clearly falling into that uh, that bucket. But if you have friends, if you have other stu superintendents, other school leaders that you hear talking like that, I would encourage you to please nudge them along. Please say no, this isn't when you want to sit out. This is when you want to jump into the pool on uh, and and help it push them so that we have a much better conversation in in you know next year. Yeah. Diane, how what what is what does your crystal ball say? You know, my kids were home a couple of weekends ago and they had Siri talking to Alexa and Alexa talking to Siri. Um, you know, we need to be aware and try these different things out. We need to attempt to break things. We need to be thinking about, you know, the possibilities that have gone wrong and all those things. I am hoping for the future that we will have people saying, okay, I tried this and this was an ultimate fail because of this and share it with others, right? So that others don't make the same mistakes. And as we're thinking of, about policy, okay, this is really good, but this part here, this needs to be in the rule because it's way too, too specific and you know, policy may change. So, I just want to see those ongoing conversations. I know in COSIN, this is a topic, uh, as we talk about professional learning and things like that, that is rising to the top. Um, you know, we, we have a commitment toward innovation and, and strategies around that. And, you know, a lot of people are really saying we need to learn more about AI and not just, um, you know, those the the um, things that we're talking about, about preventing plagiarism and all that, but we've got filters we need to deal with. We need to know, you know, what what tactics um, and ways uh, kids are poking holes in things so that we can, of course, you know, be be keeping kids safe as we do these things. So those conversations at all levels and from all roles, I think are really, really important at this time because um, our collective thoughts are going to help everyone advance. <laughs> Dave, Dave, can I do a quick build on that just real quick? So, so, so Diane, you mentioned something. You've actually mentioned this twice now, and I think it's really um, helpful, and I want to I want to sort of double-click on it, which is the idea of setting the rules or setting the context, right? Um, one of the challenges, uh, some, some of you know, I used to work for the uh, White House, the U.S. Department of Ed, and um, one of the rules that, that was created around the time that we created this thing called E-Rate to give money for schools, which you all know about, and you're all taking the check to help pay for your internet, which is great. That's exactly what you should do. Uh, but one of the rules that we created was that there had to be an acceptable use guide. Something's called responsible yes. use guide. Um, and but a weird thing happened, and that is somewhere between the idea of creating this acceptable use guide, which was an, an in attempt to help create these conditions, these healthy conditions for technology use. A weird thing happened, and I think some lawyers got involved in between. They were not from our side at the, the federal level. I think they're probably at the school side. And they started to shift those documents. And all of a sudden, they started to become these nasty legal documents uh, that are, and, and I, you, I'm a kind of geeky guy. So, so when I go to visit schools, I'll often say, and I love visiting schools, I'll say, hey, can I see a copy of your acceptable use guide? And they'll say, sure. And they'll go hand it to me. And, and I've collected them and the schools that I visit. Uh, and, and they are, you know, they, they say these things, you know, you will be 
violated and all of your information will be confiscated if you, you know, do anything wrong on this list of 800 things that you can't do. Nasty stuff. And they're giving this, you know, schools are giving this to like second graders, right? And this was a school and these little second graders like, mommy, what does it mean that the school is going to violate me for using my computer? No, no, this is not what we want to do here. And so we partnered, ISTE partnered with COSIN uh, and a couple other organizations recently to release a guide to help schools fix these really bad um, acceptable use policies. And, and the main difference, and I'll put a link to it here in the chat for those of you that are in Zoom, but uh, the main difference is set the conditions in terms of the activities you want kids to be doing with the technology, not the list of don'ts. So don't say, you know, don't do this and don't cheat and don't share your password and don't be a jerk and don't, that doesn't help. What you should do is say, what are the do's, right? We want you to be using this to help learn, right? Let's start with that, to bring new ideas to class, to use it in ways that help uplift the students around you, to help solve problems and make your school a better place. Like you see that? Those are activities. And it's still, it doesn't mean that if now you have a kid who's doing things that are, that are not in line with that, that you can't sit down and say, hey, here's the agreement. Remember, it says you're going to be using technology to bring new ideas to class. Is that what you're doing, right? Hmm, not sure. Maybe we need to take a break, right? You can still you can still have some teeth in it, but framing it as the positive of what you want to do. Use those acceptable use guys to challenge kids to use technology in ways that will blow your mind uh, with awesomeness as it comes to uh, to learning. So just just I had to had to get on a little soapbox about that because we've got to get ahead of those really nasty acceptable use guides that are out there. Yeah, and I would just say, Richard, um, to put a further thumbprint on this topic, uh, we actually eliminated our acceptable use policy and created a responsible use policy. Sure. Yes. And it was through that frame because acceptable was all about the not. And I'm like responsibility. That's what we want to teach. So creating a responsible use policy. Totally. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think for those of you on the call that don't know Richard, Diane, and I, I think all three of us are naturally very positive, half full kind of uh, open people. Um, and yet I'm I'm concerned about the next six to 12 months and how people are going to address AI because um, our kids are using it. Uh, you know, they are. It doesn't matter how old your kid is or how young your kid is, they're using it and they're going to continue to use it. And so I worry about the relevancy of school if we don't embrace the technology and our in, and its impact on instructional practices. Um, do either of you share that relevancy concern with me? It's probably not a fair question to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Well, I will say, and I'm admitting it here in front of many, um, there's that opening scene of The Terminator, very old movie from long ago. <laughs> very scary, though. And, you know, it was trying to show that when artificial intelligence takes the world over, this is what's going to happen. And I think that's, that is like way on the side, you know, of, of the spectrum over here. I'm trying to keep myself in the middle, you know, um, and, and be mindful and intentional about things. Um, you know, it's not like AI is going to solve every problem of the world. It's going to do everyone's work and, you know, and everyone will thrive and flourish it's not that, but it's also not the first scene of Terminator either. Um, and so I think, you know, we, and especially, you know, with COSIN, and I'm thinking about, um, you know, who, who we support and our association, and we're diving deep in this. Um, we, we have leaders looking to us for guidance and conversation from the technical side. And so we really need to make sure that we are educating ourselves and poking holes in the fabrics um, so that that we are ready for these changes. Yeah, and, and I would just add to that, like, like, let's be clear, there are some real challenges here, right? Sure. We're not, you know, mm -hmm. our, you know, our, you know, certainly my, my, my view on this is 
the reason I'm so bullish about getting the education community involved in the community, in the conversation is not because everything, if I thought everything was going to be perfect, I would say, cool, then do that sit it out thing and wait till it's done. The reason we need to have our school leaders involved is because there are some real challenges. One of the ones that I think is actually the most serious is something that my, my friend Tony from Tier says, and he does a lot of research on this. And it gets back to the example that Diane gave about having elect, you know, Alexa talk to Siri talk to whatever. We one real risk, and this is a real risk that we have is you have you could have a situation where you have teachers saying, I don't have time, I'm gonna create something in AI. So they create an activity in AI. Uh, and then they, you know, uh, they create an assessment in AI, hand it to kids who then use AI to answer the assessment and send it back to the teacher who then use AI, AI, to, AI to grade the assessment to send it back to the kid who then uses AI, right? Like, and, and, and what we would end up doing in that case is in each one of those transactions, the AI is actually getting smarter. You, you all understand that every time we ask AI a question, it, it learns, it's a learning uh, learning machine. And so, so we would essentially be converting our schools into activities that are training AI, and the and the humans on either side would get nothing out of it, and would actually you know while while the machines are getting smarter, and so so that you know being careful that we're not slipping into a world where we're continuing to use this old process of like lameo assessments giving to kids who are who are you know putting in answers because they're so lame that they're going back to teachers who don't even want to take the time to grade them, so they're using AI to grade them. That back if we get caught in that back and forth. Um, we, we will very effectively be using schools to train smarter AI and the humans will get nothing out of it. So that's part of why it's so critical that we say, let's use AI in very different ways. Let's stop thinking so much about only grading kids for content creation, but be sure. looking at curation, at, at, at validation and some of these new ways of thinking. Um, and and, and if, we, if we miss the boat on that one, we, we, really will, we really will be in a tough spot. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, um... A lot of teachers, I think sometimes people think that teachers got into teaching or get into teaching because they love to teach. Mm -hmm. And I think most teachers got into teaching because they love to learn. Mm -hmm. And so providing an opportunity for continued learning for our, the adults in our systems can really be powerful. And I just, I just hope that teachers and adults, administrators are provided time over the course of the next six months to play, explore, iterate and experiment um, in a healthy, positive way. Um, if, if that's the only thing, if you if you forget, if you were just checking email or having ChatGPT answer your email for this whole presentation, and the one that's the one thing that you take away, that's it right there. Give space to explore. It will it will return. It will pay you know tenfold back for you in terms of the value of the conversations and push that it is not just the one or two uh, tools that you've already heard of. Yep, we know ChatGPT. Cool. Push to try at least five uh, learning tools uh, that that are that are using AI and 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 just explore. Man, just that alone is going to really shift our ability to have more meaningful conversations. Right, Diane. Any last thoughts as we wrap up? Well, again, I think we can be in the extremes. <laughs> um, this is everyone's time for learning. Um, as the conversation has gone around this, right? Everyone should be learning. I'm thinking about how, how do we leverage the COSA network, um, you know, so that we can share um, our finds regarding, you know, what are some great sites and things like that. I mean, uh, as, as leaders model this, it's going to help others and it gives permission to others. I recall I was kind of stuck in some, um, you know, people were rolling off a board and I had to write tributes about them. And my first place was starting at chat GPT and admitting that right in the ceremony, but then revising it from there. And just that modeling, hopefully, you know, let other people know, oh gosh, she did it. I think I want to try it too. Um, and so I think that as we all um, move forward, we need to show that we are learners too. We're not just the people dispensing knowledge. Definitely, we are learning right along with everyone else. That's great. I know everybody on uh, watching on YouTube and on Zoom uh, sh shares my appreciation for the conversation and for the expertise that Richard and Diane shared today. Um, two just brilliant thought leaders who are making an impact in the in the in the country and across the world. So I want to thank you both for attending and sharing your thoughts uh, and perspectives. I hope you all join us next week for the third in our three-part series. That again, we're uh, co-sponsored between AASA 
ISTE ASCD, Digital Promise, COSIN, and Collegiate Edunation. It's going to be a great, great uh, conversation next week. I want to thank you all for joining us. Have a great summer and start to your year and spend time exploring AI. Be well, my friends. <laughs>